Hello, thanks for making time for us. I'm Karen Runlet, Knight Foundation Journalism Director. I am so excited about today's program. Every year, the leaders at the Neiman Journalism Lab ask a question about the coming year. It's simple. They ask, what do you think the new year will bring for the future of news and journalism? Except this year, we are going through 2020 the 2020, the year journalists covered a global pandemic and a turbulent economy. The year we saw massive protests for racial justice around the world and newsrooms examining their own records of racism. A year of hurricanes and fires and a national election with the highest turnout in US history, one that's still being contested. To talk about 2020 and the future of an informed nation are Neiman Lab, editor Laura Hazard-Owen, and senior writer Josh Benton. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Hi. So uh, Laura, why don't we start with you? Um, I, I, let's just set the stage. Journalism as an industry has really been ravaged by the pandemic, um, specifically advertising. So why don't you just tell us what does digital media news journalism look like right now? Sure, yeah, so it's been a crazy year. Um, there have been uh, sadly thousands of thousands of newsroom layoffs and furloughs, partly due to the pandemic and partly just due to sort of the continuing trends that um, we see as a lot of news organizations can't make it in the transition to digital. Um, we see people, um, people have less free money for, money free to pay for the subscriptions that so many news organizations are counting on now. Um, we have newspapers consolidating, hedge funds that are not the best owners buying them up. Uh, we have a racial reckoning going on in newsrooms and across the country. Um, it's been a big year. And then of course there's the election, um, which uh, I mean, probably one of the most consequential elections of our lifetimes, news organizations uh, trying to figure out how to cover a president who refuses to concede and who has uh, done more to spread um, false information than probably any, um, you know, any other source in the country right now. It's coming from the top. Um, so it's been, it's been a busy and weird year. So um, obviously that, um, it, it, that's really heavy. Are there some promising new entrants to the field at this point? Yeah, so um, I see a couple of bright spots. Um, one of those is that there are news, organi news organizations that are doing super well. Um, the Atlantic would be one success story um, with just, it's really fabulous and interesting um, reporting around COVID and tracking that data. Um, the New York Times has more digital subscribers than ever. We've seen some new newsroom, new digital newsrooms launch like the 19th, um, which focuses on women and politics in the United States. Um, so there's definitely been, you know, bright spots amid all the bad news this year. Thanks, Josh. Um, so Neiman Lab has been collecting predictions since 2011. You're coming up on a 10 year anniversary. So let's just start with who makes these prediction, predictions and how do you select them? Well, it started out with a very uh, small package of uh, maybe 20 or 30 people who I sent an email to and said, hey, you got any thoughts for the new year? Over time, it, it grew and expanded into the, 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 the megalith that it has sort of become. Um, we now publish over a hundred uh, predictions a year. I have a, a massive spreadsheet of uh, a few hundred names that, that, uh, that get an invite every year. And throughout the year, we, we do our best to try and notice new people. Uh, we have a channel in our Slack where we are constantly noting, this is an interesting person, let's, let's invite so-and-so to, you know, to give a prediction this year. And as you said, it's a, it's a pretty open request. I, I will acknowledge that many of, the, many of them are less predictions than sort of uh, wish ideations. They're, they're describing where we think we should go as opposed to where we are going. Um, but, you know, I think that's probably more, more useful as, a, as an industry exercise than uh, just saying advertising is probably going to drop again next year. Yes, absolutely. I know there's no right or wrong with these. You both emphasize that. Laura, are there one or two trends that you think leaders have been fo focused on in, in recent years? 
And then I want to hear from Josh on that. But Laura, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I think a couple of trends that came up last year that we have definitely seen just so much around this year. So one of them was about um, these changing notions of objectivity and newsrooms um, and this reckoning around race. Um, how can we expect reporters of color uh, to report on these issues in a so-called like a neutral way? Like that is something that um, we saw sort of get hinted at a lot in the predictions last year. Um, and I think it was such, such an important issue this year with the Black Lives Matter protests across the country and newsrooms just trying to figure out like how um, to cover them. Um, another trend I think that we saw a bit of, um, you know what, what uh, Laura, we actually, we actually have one of the predictions. Why don't we just pop that up um, from Tanya Mosley, since you just basically, um, you know, shared that with everyone is really important. Um, do we have that um, from NPR? Yes, just um, as, as Laura was saying, this is from 2020. Um, Tanya saying, trust me, every person of color in your newsroom has a story about a, how a manager questioned either their news judgment, their diction, or whether they could be neutral or objective. Um, Laura, please continue. I just wanted to make sure we saw that. Sure, yeah. So um, I think uh, one of the things that we've been forced to do this year that I hope more newsrooms are doing too is thinking about like, what does objectivity really de mean? Who defines it? Um, and uh, is if there's no, there's sort of like, you can't, I need to think of the best way to talk about this. Um, I don't think you can ask people to be quote unquote neutral about things that affect their own lives so directly. So maybe if you're a white man, you feel as if you can report on protests um, on a very racist president um, and his supporters. Maybe you feel as if you can report on that in a neutral way because it doesn't affect your your own life very much at all for the people who are actually dealing with these issues every day who are shaped by them. Um, I think that we just really need to change sort of the idea of the kind of experiences that we that we want reporters to bring into their reporting. Um, we always want reporting to be fair, but I think this idea of being objective is something that really needs to be um, examined and something that probably needs to be less um, emphasized. Everybody has everybody has a view. Everybody comes from somewhere, um, and I think just acknowledging that would would help us go a long way. Okay. Um, I think though that Tanya, it, Tanya was sort of expressing too that don't necessarily, her, her words are very much about don't necessarily, um, you know, don't necessarily pigeonhole me around, don't necessarily question my news judgment. That's one thing she pointed out. Um, uh, Josh, I'd really like to hear sort of what are the surprising trends that you've kind of, I mean, you've been with this for so long. What are the surprising trends that you're sort of noticing? I would, I would, I would note that I would say that the, uh, the, we saw an increase in the number of predictions that were related to diversity issues, to, to discrimination in the workplace issues and diversity and coverage issues several years ago was sort of a, an early warning for what really blossomed more broadly this, this year. Uh, and a lot of, they sort of split between uh, our both they contain both the micro level, the interactions of an individual employee uh, and, and the interactions sort of along the lines of what Tony Mosley wrote about, as well as the, the broader implications of what it means to be informing a public with a, a blinkered set of, uh, of informers, I suppose. You know, I think we've seen uh, trends go up and down uh, over the years. Some of them have matched along with technologies as they've become hot or, or cold. Uh, we certainly saw a wave of interest in VR a few years ago that has tapered off, but we don't see very many of those anymore. We had quite a few blockchain uh, predictions a few years ago, and those didn't didn't go very far. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of there are lots of debates around business model issues. I think you can you can map the the growth in the interest of paid models, uh, you know, the, so digital subscriptions uh, being important. And you've, I think you've also seen uh, some back and forth around the issues of journalists going independent. Um, this was the sort of thing that would have been discussed in a, in a blogging context uh, 10 years ago. More right. this year, it's more in the context of newsletters and sub stacks, um, which you know, in some ways is repeating uh, a lot of the, the same 
journeys that, that, we've, that we've been through. So it's, we, we try our best to draw from a very wide range of people uh, from journalists and academics and technologists and uh, you know researchers, and we hope that we're getting something like a, a, a high level thirty thousand foot view of the field. Great, thank you. I I just want to point to a couple of other really interesting uh, uh, predictions that came from last year. Um, you know there was a a very different kind of election this year. Many of us were home. There was much more early voting. There was mail-in voting. And um, there is a prediction uh, that came um, from Madeline Sanfilippo and Yafit Lev Aretz um, from CUNY's, CUNY's Bird College and Princeton. And um, that really talked about coverage of 2020 and gerrymandered news coverage as hyper personalization and geotargeting are applied at scale in news apps and mobile push notifications. I thought there were some really interesting uh, uh, tensions between the, the local conversation, the state conversation, the national conversation about how we received information from different leaders um, and how that played out in the election. So what can you tell me from your reporting, Josh, about this particular prediction? Sure. I, I don't think that we saw a huge uh, rise in the specific um, technological context that that prediction was addressing, uh, the use of, of news apps and push notifications, primarily because most people don't use any news apps and most people don't uh, rely on new push notifications to get their news. Uh, last statistic I saw was uh, only 19% of Americans said that they had uh, gotten or learned about a news story through a push notification in the past week. And a lot of those people tend to be more engaged voters who probably have an idea of what they're, what they're trying to do, what they, who they want to vote for. I do think you saw an, a, a version of that, though, with the rise of text messaging. Um, you know, I think lots of us received lots and lots of text notifications, uh, text messages from campaigns, from volunteers, uh, you know, we're text banking instead of phone banking. Um, as we've seen the polling industry respond to the shift to mobile phones uh, over the last two decades, and we've seen the difficulties that has created in their methodologies. I think you've seen campaigns wanting to make a, a similar sort of move into, into texting where phones would have been the, a method before. You know, and I, I think that you're right that we we've saw that the experience of being a candidate in uh, Atlanta is different from, or from being a voter, excuse me, in, in Atlanta is different from being a, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know, the messaging that gets sent to you is, is still is very, very tailored. I think campaigns did find though that it's still a lot easier to tailor those messages on Facebook or on Twitter or on mm -hmm. uh, YouTube um, where the, the enormous amount of, custom, of customer data that those platforms have has for good and for ill enabled a lot of very direct targeting. Great. Um, so um, let's let's turn now to some of our 2021 predictions. Um, you know, at night, um, we're um, very concerned and focused on local journalism and local news and repairing that and strengthening that and the future of it. Um, let's just talk about some of the predictions. I mean, one that I'm familiar with, um, and it comes from Rachel Shalom at um, the deputy editor for Digital at Fortune the rise of nonprofit journalism. Um, you see what she says here. Um, as anyone who has attempted to be a change maker in a storied workplace knows, it's easier to build what you want from the ground up than attempt to change the processes, priorities, and personnel in an exi existing structure. Now, um, there's, there's real tension going on in the field between um, the idea of whether a nonprofit is the way to go versus a for-profit. You know, can some, we talked about digital transition, uh, transformation right at the top of this. Are, are the organizations that exist, are they, are they able to do enough, um, fast enough um, to be competitive? Uh, so uh, Laura, can you talk a little bit about more nonprofit news and, and what's going on with for-profit organizations? The black press, legacy newspapers? Sure. So um, I think it's definitely, you know, easier, as Rachel points out in her prediction, to, um, to to sort of think about these issues when you're starting from the ground up than when you're trying to like turn a massive news organization around. Um, it can be done both. It's in both ways, and I think we're seeing news organizations grapple with that, large and small ones. But it's it's easier if you're sort of building it in from the beginning to talk about it. I think, um, and to sort of work out solutions for it. Um, I think uh, 
something that I think that's been interesting with nonprofit news organizations um, that we've seen launched this year uh, is that they have been focused more on audiences that maybe haven't been targeted as much in the past. So mm -hmm. um, the 19th focusing specifically on women um, and politics, capital B, which is launching in 2021, um, focusing on specifically on black audiences. Um, these are some, you know, I think, I think some nonprofit news organizations um, in the past have been uh, focused sort of more on, that we've seen launched in the past have focused on sort of individual topics, things like criminal justice and education and things like that. Um, and I think it's interesting to see these new ones come up that are attempting to reach new audiences um, in different ways. We have a question, oh, we have a question question from Trista Thurston about maybe what you're seeing for smaller newsrooms and, and local newsrooms. Um, I think that small and local newsrooms have definitely like struggled this year. I think like in a lot of ways, um, small local newsrooms have been hit the hardest um, by some of the advertising losses around COVID just because they had, you know, they have less of a cushion, they have sort of less, less of a safety net. Um, and um, you know, so some smaller news organizations have closed, some local news outlets have closed um, just because of lack of funding. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's tough out there. Um, I think uh, we've seen a few sort of interesting um, startups in this area. So one of them is Vote Beat, um, which was launched by the funder of Chartbeat. Um, Vote Beat is focusing on sort of granular reporting around local elections, um, being very nimble and putting reporters um, in communities around the country to vote on sort of like the election and its aftermath, um, maybe replacing some of the kinds of reporting that larger news publications have, have just had to cut out. Um, and so I think it's interesting to see uh, sort of ways to be creative about that and, you know, put local reporters in places where um, maybe they hadn't been able to be due to funding issues previously. Okay, um, you know, we are taking questions from the audience. So we've already gotten one from Trista. So Trista Thurston, so if anybody else wants to join in, please do. Um, okay, um, Josh, um, let's look at um, another, another, you've got, you have about, is it 18? Um, posted at the moment? Um, uh, somewhere around there. Yeah, okay, so some of them Any are already- more to be posted over the next week and a half. Of course, um, they you, you post them as they come out. Um, so um, Mark Stenberg, a reporter for Business uh, Insider, um, we have a prediction from him. Um, and he basically says, I've noticed that, that the difference between influencers, creators, and journalists seem to shrink every time I check on it reporting on not just Substack, but Patreon, Cameo, Twitch, and OnlyFans. I find myself struck more by the similarities than the distinctions between entertainers, artists, journalists. So um, Josh, if you could talk a little bit about the reporting and uh, there's been a lot of conversation about independence, as you said, and Substack. How is your reporting sort of, what does your reporting have to say about this trend? You know, it's interesting. I, I, I thought uh, that was an interesting prediction by, by Mark, and I think it's, it's true uh, on one level and maybe not as true on another. In the same way that uh, an individual celebrity might be making money on the side by doing cameos for 30 bucks a pop or 50 bucks a pop, or whatever it may be, um, those celebrities still work in movies or work in a TV show or work within the context of a larger organization that has a corporate entity that has uh, licensing deals. Uh, I'll, the independent part of, of the entertainment business and the, the sort that Mark is talking about is significant, but it's still much smaller than the institutionalized uh, business that, that these folks are being a part of as well. And I, I think what, what he's identifying correctly is that the balance between those two is, is forever shifting. You know, if you wanted to be an independent actor as a journalist, uh, 
40 years ago, um, uh, you know, even a freelancer then was still reliant on publications to take their articles and to, you know, pay them every once in a while. Um, mm -hmm. Unless you're I have Stone starting your own newsletter, or something like that, the, the path to true independence was was a very, very logistically difficult one. Um, now it's available. And that means for certain people, um, those who have a, an existing following that they can bring with them, those who have a specific type of reporting and or commentary they do that is attractive to the marketplace and that is uh, a, the, the sort of work that can be readily monetized, um, great. Um, that's still only a, a share of the tens of thousands of people who, who do important journalistic work in this country. And I think for those folks, the institutional model is still going to be the, the main way to go for some time. Okay. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, mention another prediction that we have here from Aaron Foley. We've, we've talked about, um, we've talked about race. We've talked about um, the conversation in newsrooms, some of it um, um, very heated, very angry. Um, and Aaron is actually um, talking about a solution that could really help young diverse journalists. Um, and he talks about um, joint ventures and reporting collaborations, not operating agreements between, between general market publications and community weeklies and Metro dailies. Um, would you talk a little, Laura, would you talk a little bit about um, those trends and how they're playing out? Absolutely, yeah. I think partnerships are an amazing way, um, both for larger news organizations to um, publish some coverage that they may not have reporters covering to get just to broaden broaden the scope of what they publish. And it's a great uh, way for the smaller news organizations that are reporting these stories to get more eyeballs on their work. I mean, I think we've seen um, all kinds of news organizations doing this. Um, so it's not just those um, you know, community weeklies, it's also, you know, places like ProPublica that are doing these joint um, publishing collaborations with other news organizations, things like that. I think partnerships are, um, are just a great way to get more work in front of more readers, partly because, you know, um, it's not that, not as if people really go to um, homepages very much anymore. Um, you know, people are not even probably getting, like, most people are not going to the New York, the New York Times homepage, even for example, every day. But they're definitely not going to the homepage of these, um, you know, small uh, nonprofits and local news sites and things like that. So getting these work, this work in front of more people, I think is a great thing. Um, I think something that you want to be careful of in these partnerships, and um, we've seen this in our reporting on sort of like the logistics of just how this works, um, and you know, sort of what some of the pitfalls can be, um, what some of the sort of pain points can be, um, is to just have the partners uh, be very uh, communicative about sort of what they both are wanting to get out of this um, and to sort of be be talking about what this, what these partnerships are going to look like so that one side or the other, um, you know, doesn't come away feeling resentful or that the smaller organization doesn't come away feeling as if its content is being um, you know, used without any real benefit. Yeah, definitely in the night research and in the grants that we've done, we've definitely seen um, the stronger partnerships. They really have a memorandum of um, understanding upfront to really make sure that there's equity there. Um, and the, um, the I'd like to go to a, another prediction that we have here. Um, and um, again, this is from um, Ben, Ward Mueller, um, product developer and open web advocate. Um, in place of the monolithic super platforms that were the hallmark of using the internet over the last decade, we see, a, we see smaller independent publications and websites that address the needs of their communities more closely. Across our devices, we will have a single place to read all our newsletters, subscriptions, powered by feeds and email. Um, again, um, we, um, I'm, we talked about the theme of independence, um, Josh, and um, what this sort of looks like. This sort of points to that as well. 
would you share some of the, again, would you share some of the reporting around this trend? Uh, sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, in some ways, it's, a, it's an attempt to revive what we had with RSS readers and Google Reader about uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, you know, I think it is, uh, I'm perhaps not as optimistic as, as Ben is about the idea that uh, people will flee Facebook and flee Twitter and flee YouTube and the, the giant platforms that uh, have established so much cultural power and financial power over the past uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, it would certainly be an improvement, I think, if people did move towards uh, smaller communities, smaller platforms, more dedicated to specific uh, tasks or specific cultures, whatever it may be. Um, I just don't know if that is a trend that can be uh, that is easily stopped, uh, is easily prevented from being eaten by one of those giant tech companies. I mean, what is the closest equivalent to that right now? Probably Facebook groups, um, which uh, is part of the megalith, but is nonetheless yeah. trying to offer this smaller uh, e e social experience with, within it. Uh, there's still a lot of forces uh, trending towards aggregating power in those few companies in Northern California. Um, uh, you know, one thing that I think will be very interesting for 2021, uh, I haven't seen a prediction about it yet, but uh, is what will happen with, with antitrust enforcement, uh, yep. both against Google and Facebook. If there's anything that is going to reverse those, uh, the giant sucking sound, as Ross Perot might have put it, uh, going towards Silicon Valley, uh, I would think it would have to be something coming out of DC and coming out of Brussels. I would love, yeah, I would love to just jump in quickly with one more thing about that. Um, mentioning the markup, which is another um, very, you know, success story newsroom that launched this year. Um, that's sort of looking at algorithms and the kind of things that tech companies don't show us how those are impacting our daily lives. I think um, it's interesting to think about how people are still uh, reading and subscribing to these newsletters, which is through um, Gmail and you you can subscribe all you want. I have a bunch of newsletters that I subscribe to on Substack that I would uh, that I would like to have in front of me every day. Um, and you know, you still see that um, Gmail filters things out, it hides things. Um, it doesn't necessarily put the things that you subscribe to right in front of you. Um, and I think it's sort of a reminder of how you can sort of seek this stuff out to an extent um, and you can mm -hmm. subscribe and you can support it. And even then um, there are going to be sort of tech um, companies kind of in the way. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we've really completely achieved this this vision of having content just come directly to to you, there's still sort of an intermediary, and so that's something I'm thinking about with this prediction. With this prediction, um, is like, how do I make sure, even if I want to subscribe to all these newsletters and get them, how like, what is the best way for me actually to be reading them? Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, uh, Laura, specifically to you, you were talking about not the best owners, and there is a question just around uh, not the best owners buying newspapers and newspaper chains. So how do you, just a little bit more clarity on how do you define a bad owner? Oh, sure. I mean, I guess I should probably just say that I think hedge funds are bad owners for, um, for newspapers. Um, that's the trend that we're seeing is that hedge funds are buying them up, um, consolidating them trying to make uh, the most money off of them. And I don't think that when um, owners are trying to maximize profit that that's a good thing for news. Um, you know, so one thing we've seen is um, local newsrooms shuttering, even if they still, um, you know, have employees, they don't they no longer have a physical presence. That's something that's happened, mm -hmm. especially this year with COVID, just offices uh, shutting down and not coming back. Um, you know, I think it also means um, if you're trying to maximize um, content, your like sort of revenue from content, you're going to publish certain stories uh, that audiences that sort of get a lot of um, clicks, and you're going to get few, you're going to see less sort of nitty gritty like local type reporting um, that these publications might have been able to do in the past, and with these new owners can no longer do. Um, so, you know, I think it's, I think it's really tricky. Uh, Josh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Josh, I, uh, there's a, an appreciation for your observation about sort of VR and blockchain. And um, this, is, this is a question asking for a bit of an observational trend on these kinds of forecasts over the years, sort of um, 
do, is, is there sort of a bit of a forecast, maybe uh, the, the trends that you're reporting on? Because again, you're not making your own predictions exactly, but on um, just the work, the process. Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, when we started doing this uh, a decade ago, there was, uh, it was relatively fresh out of the, of the financial crisis. Um, things were still very difficult uh, in the business. And there was a huge focus on the business model question that was that was core to what everyone was was thinking mm -hmm. and as a result the predictions i think matched that as well i think over time it's not as if the business model has been solved it's not as if uh, we, we figured it all out and we can all go home uh it's it's more that i think there is a sense that uh, the, the problems are a bit are a bit baked in at this point there there isn't some giant money truck coming around the corner um, so it, on the business side there's been a shift towards uh more strategy within uh, the large buckets of advertising and more specifically around subscription. You've seen a lot more thinking about uh, the customer relationship uh, in, in predictions in recent years. I also think you've seen a, a increase in people talking about working within news organizations. I mean, we mentioned that in the case of uh, the Tanya Mosley prediction and, and issues around discrimination, but uh, a larger uh, attention being paid to you know, from the mental health of journalists to, uh, you know, working conditions, you know, the rise in unionization, a lot of digital, digital newsrooms, things in that front. And we've also seen more predictions that are around the uh, consumer end of, of journalism. Um, this was really sparked uh, by 2016 and the rise of fake news and misinformation and disinformation. Uh, I think uh, our predictors care more now about how their news is reaching the end customer more, more than would have been the case a decade ago. At least that's how it looks in from the point of view of our predictions. Uh, I, I think in general, uh, it's a healthy trend that in all of these cases, you're seeing a shift away from, we need to find something that will fix our problem uh, as a business more towards, we need to figure out how to get better uh, in, in a host of ways. And I think it's a, I think it's a, a useful trend, a useful shift. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, I just sat in a grantee meeting yesterday where we talked about mental health of journalists, but we also talked about mental health of audiences. We talked about the fact that if you look at any kind of self-care article, it will say, stop reading so much news, stop listening to so much news. And what does that mean for the consumer and how are they interacting with right. something that we think is so important for democracy? So that question came to us from Andrew Devagal. Um, uh, we have um, one of the oh, things we, we published. A, I published a, a prediction today from Marissa Evans, who's at the, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, and hers was all about uh, the degree to which newsrooms are going to have to be much more comprehensive in how they deal with reporting on the trauma that Americans have felt yes. in 2020. Um, and she made the observation, which I thought was a smart one, that it's when we have thought about trauma-informed reporting in newsrooms, it has typically been around victims of sexual assault, uh, the survivors of the victims of mass shootings, things that are, you know, criminal in nature. Um, whereas, uh, you know, many of the traumas that Americans have experienced in, in 2020 have been around uh, unemployment, have been around, you know, stress from the election, have been around, you know, obviously enormous public health issues. Um, Things that are much more systemic that don't have the the news hook of a shooting, for example, to, to hang your coverage on. And uh, she had a line there along the lines of, uh, you know, we're, it's going to take us years to figure out uh, to to really be able to address the amount of trauma that is, you know, that the American public has suffered in in the past year or so, and that's going to have to change the way that newsrooms cover those issues. Absolutely. Um... I have a question. I'm not sure which of you guys wants to take it. It's from Jenna Spinell. Uh, um, how should journalism students, particularly those graduating this spring, we're already walking into a, a tricky economy, be thinking about the industry and their place within it and what can journalism school faculty be doing to help them? Uh, anyway. I, 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 can, I can talk about that. The, okay. uh, I mean, I, I whenever I talk to college students, I always try to emphasize the degree to which uh, all of the digital technologies that we've that have arrived in the past decade plus have enabled uh, individual journalists to take much more initiative um, than was the case when they had everything had to be approved by an editor and work through uh, a newsroom chain of command. Um, you know, 20 years, uh, 15 years ago, that the answer would have been, hey, you know, start a blog. 
now it is probably uh, figure out a niche that you're interested in covering and start a podcast and start a, a sub stack about it. But I think it's really important for, for journalists who have gone through journalism school and may be ready, may be well prepared for a institutionalized form of journalism uh, to be very aggressive and ambitious around doing independent work and showing that initiative. I think both A, that's very appealing to the editors who will be hiring in news organizations. They want that same spirit uh, in, their, in their news operations. But even if it's not, um, you know, there, there are, you open yourself up to a whole world of, of more options if you can try and play the journalism game on, on several different levels at the same time. I also think that um, one sort of possible um, great spot of the pandemic, if I can say that, is that in-person um, events are not really happening right now. And so a lot of like the education, um, the panels, the classes that you might've had to be in person in New York taking in the past have moved online. Um, and so for uh, people who wanna take advantage of those and there's so much, um, there is greater access to that. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's one way that this, that some, you know, more people may be able to participate than have in the past. I, um, I, I want to thank you both for joining us. Um, I do want to give you sort of final, a final word or a final thought, um, just really on something. Look, we, it, 2020 um, actually started, um, you know, um, started out, um, nobody, exactly understood what was to come. And we walk away at least with um, knowledge of a vaccine coming. So I, I'd love to leave on a, a little bit of something to look forward to in 2021, something that you've reported on that you think is um, especially anything you might mention about local journalism or local news, but other examples as well. Thoughts? <laughs> sure, yeah, so, um... You know, one thing I might say, um, and this is not specifically only about local news organizations, but it's certainly something that we can do. Um, I think um, at the beginning of the year, especially when people were thinking about the election coming um, and sort of how news organizations had covered Trump over the past four years, I think that there was a lot of fear that news organizations would not be able to rise to the task and cover um, some of these issues, things like Trump lying, um, just being sort of, uh, you know, Trump saying just things that are just not true, um, that, that news organizations would continue to have trouble sort of reporting on that. And I think we have seen a lot of them find their way um, in terms of the way that they are reporting on what he says, um, the way that they're reporting on what other sort of right-wing figures say, I think that the reporting has gotten better and more nuanced um, and that uh, reporters have gotten more practice at sort of um, thinking about how to convey these things to audiences, convey that just because someone said it doesn't mean that that's true and providing context and things like that. I think that any, um, you know, news organization can get better at doing that and it's, it's, I feel optimistic having seen them get better at it. Um, I think it's going to be especially important um, as the vaccine, as you mentioned, rolls out um, that we think about, the newsrooms think about the types of misinformation that can be um, spread around health and medicine and the vaccine and coronavirus, um, sort of moving away from election related misinformation. We had a piece on our um, site this week from First Draft about that and thinking more about health misinformation and how are we going to be, you know, thinking about that issue and conveying um, information about the vaccine and, and its rollout um, and side effects and things like that to our audiences in a way that is true and doesn't scare them and takes into account the fact that, um, you know, there is still a lot of misinformation out, out there. I, I'd, I'd also agree that I think that with, with, I don't know if we can say that the Trump era is in the rearview mirror yet. Uh, it, it certainly isn't uh, officially according to the calendar, but I think that the, the media can definitely look back at the last uh, four years and realize that the Trump era has been quite good for American journalism. And I don't mean that in the less moon bez, like, you know, he, he might be bad for the country, but he's good for CBS uh, a sense. I don't mean that purely financially. I mean that uh, this administration has been an opportunity for journalists to rethink a lot of uh, 
uh, their workflows, how they think about important issues, how they think about uh, the needs to address parts of the country that uh, they, they weren't doing as, as well as they might have. I think it's also been uh, an experience that has really uh, trained a lot of people to be willing to be willing to pay for digital journalism in a way that just wasn't the case four years ago. And I think that's uh, something that can be taken forward into 2021. I'm very curious to see what a what a Biden administration does to uh, the tenor of news consumption and of news production in the country. Uh, so much of our news world has been so focused on one man. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how the, the environment we've built up to cover that one man will transition to uh, a very different sort of man who will not be hogging as much of the stage and uh, human attention. Uh, I also think, uh, if on an op optimistic note, I, I do think that we are seeing a, a set of recipes for local digital startups uh, become a little bit more clear. I, I think that uh, new startups are not having to reinvent the wheel to the same degree they might have a few years ago. Uh, there are sort of established patterns, and I think there's a an established audience waiting uh, for, for digital news at the local level that I wouldn't have said was there a few years ago. But, you know, uh, I'm, I would be shocked if there were more American journalists employed at the end of 2021 than there are at the end of 2020. But I do think that there are, and we have a host of challenges around polarization uh, and, you know, people sort of checking out of the news. I do think there are reasons to think that things are getting a little bit more stable in some important ways though. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Josh Benton. Thank you, Laura, Laura uh, Hazard Owen. Um, you can follow them both on Twitter at Jay Benton at Laura Hazard Owen um, and Neiman Neiman Lab, of course. Thank you so much for joining us today, and th and thank you for everybody for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.